Cosmology and the heavens it studies have something of a complicated relationship. After all, in a way, the essence of the discipline poses the question, can science do a better job of understanding the universe than philosophy or religion? For his opinion on that, we are joined by Lawrence Krauss, director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University and foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. It's great to have you back here at TVO. I love talking to you, Steve. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Well, we had a chance to talk to one of your pals, Kenneth Miller, on um, these notions of atheism and whether all scientists should be atheists, which I think you said last time you were here. Well, I think I wrote a piece recently. I think you did. So yeah. let's take a look at what he said, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll it, please. When Lawrence Krauss says that scientists must be militant atheists, I'm going to translate what he said. And that is, I think what he says is that when we look at the world around us, when we conduct our experiments, when we try to interpret, I as a molecular biologist, what I see on a gel or what I see in an electron microscope, it's not legitimate within the scientific method to invoke God as a direct cause for physical phenomenon. Mm. So in that respect, I would say I'm a non-theist when it comes to designing and executing experiments. But I think this idea that the universe is intelligible is a kind of faith that all of us share in science. The non-believer has no reason for believing that the universe is intelligible, but the person of faith really does because we see a kind of intelligence behind the universe that makes science possible. Okay, non-believer, you want to come back well, on that? I know Ken very well. We've, we've cited several times on, on uh, work together. Um, uh, first of all, he, he got it sort of right. The re I wrote a piece called well, All Scientists Should Be Milton Atheists, but what I meant by that is that whenever I write, when I wrote my last book, when I just say, we ask the question, can you make a universe without God or is it sensible? Just asking the question, you get labeled as a militant atheist. Mm -hmm. A word with no meaning as far as I can, what is a militant atheist? Does it throw leaflets at people? I, I don't know what a militant atheist is. So I wanted to point out that to the extent that nothing should be sacred, that everything should be subject to question, even the existence of God in polite company, on television, in politics, it's okay to say, you know what? There's no evidence for God, or I don't, you know, it just seems nonsensical to me. It's okay to say it, that in that sense, all scientists should be mil militant atheists because we sh science is based on questioning. Now, when it comes to what Kenneth said, look, we, I don't take anything on faith, and I... I don't think any real scientist does. I know that Ken is a, is, is a devout Catholic, and, but, but, and, I, and it's fine. What, what he's a proof of is that scientists can be religious, but scientists can be Republicans, too. So there's no, there's no you know. <laughs> you don't think there's any contradiction between being a scientist and... Of course there is a complete contradiction. You but, think there but, is. You, but people yeah. are able to have two completely opposing views at the same time because people aren't purely rational beings. Mm. The point is that it doesn't matter whether you have faith that the universe is intelligible or not. What science does is continue to ask questions about the universe and try and find answers. And maybe there'll be some limits to science, but people will say, you know, ultimately science can't explain this or that. What ultimate conceit is that? Because they're saying, I know, I know the ultimate answer, and, and I know science will never be able to get there. And the problem with religion in general is, it assumes the answers before it asks the questions. And ultimately, science if I mean the question, you can ask the question: Is there evidence of, of design or purpose? The answer is there hasn't been. Now, does that prove there's no evidence of there is no design or purpose? No. But science can look for these things. As I, as I often say, if I looked up tonight and saw the stars suddenly realign and in ancient Aramaic, not English, of course, because God we know speaks in ancient Aramaic, um, it said you know it said I am here. You know I'd say maybe there's something to that. But we have tried and looked, and so people want to believe, as Fox Muldar would have said in The X-Files. <laughs> and, and Ken wants yeah. to believe, and I understand that. And as, as Ken pointed out, as long as he is a, an, an atheist in the laboratory, that's all that really matters. But you know, there's a very famous biologist, Duncan Haldane, I think was his name, Haldane, a long time ago, who said exactly this. When I go in the laboratory, I don't think there's any angels twisting the knobs and my dials and my thing. So if I'm an atheist in the laboratory, why shouldn't I be an atheist outside the laboratory? And, 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 you know, atheism is not a belief system. It's just saying, you know, unless I have evidence for something, I'll, I'll, I'm skeptical You're about saying, it. You're saying, show me. You're from Missouri. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and so faith or no faith, it doesn't matter. The universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. I suspect you know the Harvard philosopher, Roberto Mungabera Unger. 
I've heard of him. You've yes. heard of him. Okay. He was on our program last year talking about cosmology, something near and dear to your heart. And here's what he had to say about science's role in understanding the universe. Clip number two. Roll it, please. We have different ways of approaching the world in art, in religion, uh, in philosophy, and in science. Uh, there's no certain hierarchy of these different ways of uh, understanding the world. Uh, scientism is the belief that science is supreme, that it has the prerogative over our other approaches to reality. But I say, scientism stands to science as militarism stands to the army. Scientism does science no favors. So I guess he thinks you're a scientist who preaches scientism, and he doesn't well, like that. You know, these, I love people who invent meaningless terms to try and give pejorative context to things. So, uh, you know, it, it's always interesting to me that philosophers like to write about cosmology, but cosmologists don't write about philosophy, probably for good reason. This, the cosmology has content. But, uh, uh, Put a boom. yeah, okay, but <laughs> more importantly, look, this argument that there's scientism is just, it's just, I don't know what the word means, but what, but there is a hierarchy of knowledge. And, and we've been very, we have this TV studio because of it. Empirical evidence, theories based on empirical evidence that can be tested is the basis of, of the scientific method, which is the basis of modern civilization. So science so, is the supreme way to understand the world. Empir well, the scientific process, which is empirical evidence. There, I would argue, and this, is, this might, might seem controversial to some people, but I would argue there is no knowledge but empirical knowledge. Mm -hmm. that, that revelation is almost always wrong. And so all of our rational reasoning is based on evidence about the universe. You can call that philosophy, and it's fine. That's what mm -hmm. philosophy is, is critical reasoning based on evidence. But that process is what drives us forward. And it is, there is a hierarchy. That is what knowledge is based on. The other stuff is myth, superstition, or pontification. Art, religion, philosophy, they are all handmaidens to science, in your view. What all of those are, are different ways of trying to learn about ourselves, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and art and music and literature you know, create fictional worlds or, or, or lyrical worlds that still cause us to reflect on ourselves. Uh, science does that in, in, a, in a very similar way. It's a cultural activity. But, uh, but when it comes to understanding the universe, there really is only one way, and that's science. Okay. Let's take a break from atheism for a second. Okay. We'll talk about uh, Well, thinking. that wasn't atheism. That was, that was, that was just, that well, was just a, a fact about understanding the universe. And so... Uh, but, you know, but, but science is an atheistic activity in the sense that I've been a scientist for 35 years. I've never, got, you know, people think it's a big issue. No one ever brings up God because, in fact, it's not important. And so in, when it in comes the lab, to, you're saying. In the lab or in science. I've never been to a scientific meeting where the word God has come up. And so as my friend Steve Weinberg, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist and an atheist, says, most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. Not at all. You know Catherine Fries? Yes. She said roughly 95% of the universe is not intelligible to us yet because it's all dark matter and dark energy. How confident are you that we are ever going to crack the secrets of that 95% of the universe? I mean, ever's a long yeah. time, but how about, how about no, in our... Look, we're making great progress. We wouldn't... Uh, uh, two decades ago, we didn't even know that 70% of the universe existed. We didn't even know the existence of dark energy. Uh, 40 years before that, we didn't know about the existence of dark matter. I think that the dark matter issue is much more amenable to experiment. I proposed 30 years ago experiments that are now being done to look for dark matter. They're difficult. And so I wouldn't be surprised, although I wouldn't guarantee, but I wouldn't be surprised in the ne next decade or two if we discovered the nature of dark matter. Hmm. Um, it may require bigger experiments. It may, be, it may be more. Dark energy is going to be a lot more difficult problem because it's fundamentally uh, uh, unintelligible at the current time. None of our theories... Uh, uh, fit with, with the existence of dark energy, which is what makes it so exciting, because it's the most exciting puzzle in the universe. Mm -hmm. People think scientists are happy knowing things. Scientists are happier being puzzled, because it means there's, you know... There's uh, work. There's job security, <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, the search is often more interesting than the finding. So dark energy could take decades, it could take centuries. Uh, it, it's going to be very hard to probe experimentally any more than we've done. And it's going to be... A, it I, probably requires a good idea rather than a good experiment. And, Good ideas are, are often few and far between. You have taken us back to the moment of the Big Bang. 
Can you take us back, can science take us back to the moment just before the Big Bang? Well, I'll tell you and it won't make you happy. Um, or it might not, but I, it's Steve, Stephen Hawking and I kind of agree on this in this sense. The question may not be a good question. It may just be a bad question because if the universe spontaneously came into existence, as I've argued all the evidence suggests, space and time are tied together in relativity. So if space came into existence, then time may have come into existence. There may have been no before. And so the whole hmm. question of what was before the Big Bang may be a poorly framed question. We may have to reanalyze re or investigate our ideas of cause and effect if time comes into existence. So hmm. it may it may just be something that we requires us to, to change the way we view the universe, which is, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's just, you know, slippery, but I call it learning. And, and, and so it may, it may be a bad question. On the other hand, our universe may be one of a multitude of universes which came into existence. Our universe came into existence 13.8 billion years ago. It may be part of a vast multiverse of universes which are coming into existence and going out of existence. And time itself, some globally defined concept of time, may be sensible. And then maybe we'll be able to, it'll be a sensible question. We don't know the answer, and it's okay not to know the answer. If you're right, though, and it's not a great question because there's nothing, uh -huh. you can't be surprised then that religion has entered the fray in order to fill that gap in our understanding of everything. No, no, it's in, it fills a gap in what we want to be okay, case. So you see, the problem with religion, you say, okay, I don't like the idea that there was nothing. It doesn't make me comfortable, and therefore I want to create something that makes me feel warm and fuzzier. But you know, part of the purpose of science is to make us uncomfortable. Part of the purpose of learning is to make us uncomfortable. Because if we're always in our comfort zone, we're never stretching. We're never going beyond where we were. And so it, new ideas are often uncomfortable. Science chooses to say, you know what, I'll force my beliefs to conform with the evidence of reality. What religion does is say, you know what, I'll take what I like. I like the idea that someone's looking after me, that someone created a universe for just me. And then I'll, for, I'll force the universe to conform to that belief. Well, that's fine, and it makes some people happy, but it doesn't make it true. Is there anything you like about religion at all? Well, look, there's no doubt that religion, for some people, provides solace, comfort, a sense of community. If it didn't, it wouldn't have been around for much of human civilization. Mm -hmm. So it meets fundamental human needs, probably evolutionarily meets fundamental human needs. So. That's, that being the case, however, doesn't mean we can't meet those needs with something that actually doesn't conform to reality. On the whole, religion is bad for humanity. And I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you one of the reasons that I hadn't really hit, hit upon me until I wrote my last book and we did our last movie, The Unbelievers. I get letters every day from young people and older people around the world who tell me, you know what, seeing this or reading your book makes me realize I'm not alone. I used to think I was a bad person for questioning whether God existed. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people around the country and this country and other countries who feel because religion has got a monopoly on morality that somehow questioning the existence of God makes you a bad person. And people should realize that it's okay to question. I'm not, I don't care what their answer is, but it's okay to question. It's okay to not feel like a bad person. And you know what? Not accepting myth and superstition doesn't make you a bad person. And in that sense, I think religion is, is negative because it makes so many people feel guilty or bad about themselves. Let me follow up. You, you talk about the monopoly on morality. It, it also, in some respects, has a monopoly on politics these days. Yeah. And I know that you know you like science because it takes us away from politics. But yeah. I'm going to put us into oh, politics okay, for sure. a second. Okay, sure. Oh, here. I get involved in politics every now and then. I know you do. Let's. Let, here's a couple of numbers I want to lay on you here. Uh, a Pew survey from 2007. 61 percent of U.S. adults said they would be less likely to vote for an atheist presidential candidate. Gallup does another survey last year says 58% of Americans would vote for a qualified atheist candidate. That surprises so, me. It, a majority of Americans. I mean, that's mm -hmm. quite, in, quite astonishing in some respects. Are we at the point yet where you think somebody running for the highest office in the world could run for that office and openly say, I don't believe in God? I would love it if it were true. I don't think it's the case. I mean, I, I follow, I've written about these surveys, and, and, and it, you didn't even hit it. The, let me make it even clearer. The Pew survey, it's been done a few times, mm -hmm. shows not only would people be less likely to vote for an atheist candidate, but it's the, of all the characteristics, lack of, ex, of experience, infidelity, financial impropriety, even being a Muslim, all of them in, are above atheism. So that's one, the, that's one the survey said that atheists were, uh, the only people who, who were as low as atheists were rapists. And so that mm -hmm. is really unfortunate. So I think we have a way to go, but I think we need people to come out and be willing to do it. And if we had, well, I wrote a piece saying, 
you know, mocking in some sense Justice Scalia. I wrote a piece saying that the, they should pick an atheist in the Supreme Court because Scalia said there wasn't enough diversity. There were just Catholics or Jews and there should be some <laughs> evangelical Protestants. I pointed out that 20% of the American public, at least, identify themselves as having no religious affiliation. They're not represented. And if we, if we openly accepted such people in those positions, the very least it would do would be point out, point out that there's nothing wrong. You're not a bad person. It's not immoral to ask questions. You know, there are, some, there are a number of states that don't allow you to run for political office if you're, if you're an atheist. Hmm. Well, consider this, though. If you, I, I can't recall a time in American political history where two men who were pretty obviously not that religious are doing so well. And I'm thinking, of course, Donald Trump and um, Senator but Sanders. But Donald Trump has to play lip service to, if you, he, he caters to evangelicals yeah, tremendously. But even talks the evangelicals with, know he's not really religious. Well, I'm not sure. That's what's amazing. You'd think they would. And no, they, they know. They well, know. and they're hard of hearts, and, but they want to believe. They want to believe. But you're right. Yeah. Bernie Sanders, in fact, is openly... He, he, doesn't, we, talk, he doesn't talk about religion. I, I, yeah. I was just talking to his wife a, a, a few weeks ago about this. But How do you know her? Uh, I happened to meet her at a dinner party, oh, actually. Okay. But, but uh, I think, you know, it's relatively recent. You know, the, this, this need to play e lip service to evangelical groups has been relatively recent, even in the Republican Party. It didn't used to be the case. I mean, Thomas Jefferson's a good example. I mean, you, you, could, you could be a politician and not, and not pretend that you believed in things you don't believe. I suspect that we have had many atheist presidents that just didn't, you know, they couldn't say it. Hmm. And as Richard said in, in our movie, it would be great if Dawkins. former presidents would Richard come Dawkins. out after the fact. It'll be... It'll be interesting to see. I think you'll find that um, Bernie Sanders wouldn't appeal. I mean, it's, it, it, won't, it won't help him to come out and, uh, you know, he, and say he's an atheist if he is, because he's, he's already lost those voting groups that anyway, by his other policies. I think it would, it's important that we do have candidates and we just continually have, and, and, and well-known celebrities and well-known scientists and other people who come, it's true, you know, I always say is we're one generation away. I would, have, maybe both of us, I would have been amazed a generation ago to find that gay marriage would be approved in the United States. Mm. I just would have, I'm amazed. What did it take? Well, my, people of my daughter's age, you know, lots of gay people, like gay couples, they realize there's nothing wrong. It's not, no matter what the old white males who are, who are legislating say, for the next generation, it's a done deal. They just don't understand the problem. It, we're always one generation away. Hmm. And if we were somehow to basically encourage free thinking in the next generation, this question would be gone. It's been, you know, with, with gay rights, with, with, with gays in general, with, to some extent, racism, which had taken a lot longer and it's still not gone away, we, we're able to get rid of these things in a single generation. The young people are the hope. And of course, it's for that reason that so many evangelicals want to get hold of the young people. And, hmm. and as I often say, Imposing religion on a young person is child abuse. Okay, I, that's a whole other show, and <laughs> no, I'm not going yeah, to go there, there right I know, now. I thought I'd say it just to get but you going, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> but you know, I mean, God's on your money, Lawrence. The word God is on your money. It's yeah. going to be pretty hard to get rid of that, don't you think? It, 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 it is. Look, I'm not being naive about this. I think, look, and, and my goal isn't to get rid of God on our money. My goal is to have, as a scientist and a person who fortunately has a public voice to try and get people to learn about the real universe, the real universe is so amazing we don't need all the nonsense. So all I really want people to do is be willing to accept the universe for what it is and be excited by it. And I think as a corollary, we'll get rid of myth and superstition, but that's not my main interest. If we can't base public policy on sound empirical evidence instead of ideology or religion, then we're never going to solve the problems of the 21st century. So the whole issue of whether science and religion can coexist is really not of interest to you then? It, it isn't of interest to me. Yeah. Science works and... It, and, it, and, and Public policy should be based on science, not, not religion, for obvious reasons, because global warming, energy, health, all of those things require dealing with the real world. You know, we always hate your visits here because you never say anything interesting <laughs> or controversial. <laughs> well, next time I'll try. I'll try and work on that. That's Lawrence Krauss from ASU. So good to see you again. Thanks for coming in at TVO tonight. Thanks again. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.